Well, good morning from Monterrey, Mexico. I'm pleased now to be able to offer an iFaith talk from Esther. It's number 113, the last one in this unit of the later uh, historical books. And then we'll get into unit 17 and conclude the entire iFaith series as we look at the later prophets. Esther is a great book. It's short, it's easy. The plot is simple. It's quite simple to follow the action. And there's such colorful characters like, well, silly King Xerxes or the disgusting Haman. There's lovely Esther and wise Mordecai. It's a book of delightful reversals and coincidences. One of my favorite sermons I ever preached, this was before I tried to start preaching expositorily, working from the text, was a sermon on Esther 4.14. For many of us, that'll be our favorite verse in the whole book. Esther is the story of a heroic woman. She's not unlike Miriam, courageous, not unlike Ruth or Deborah or the Samaritan woman. And like the book of Daniel, which we looked at in the previous unit, the little book of Esther really shows international politics in a biblical light. That is, God is sovereign. Leaders should be humble. They should not take themselves too seriously. What God is looking for is not arrogance, but uh, acknowledgement of his sovereignty. We also see at times that human kingdoms can clash with the kingdom of God. And at such times, great courage is needed. Esther is also famous because it's the book of the Bible where you don't find the word God, at least not in the Hebrew Bible. The Greek version is a little bit longer. But his name isn't mentioned there, and so some people find that to be a real problem, also because uh, there's a lack of Esther manuscripts among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So maybe some Jews felt awkward about it because it doesn't mention God's name, and yet that would, that would not be a good conclusion. As we'll see in our title, God is Behind the Scenes. I mention it's a book of reversals. For example, in chapter 1 and in chapter 10, you have uh, splendor, wealth, uh, opulence. They're feasting and their decrees. In chapters 2 and 9, Esther and Mordecai uh, save Xerxes. In chapters 3 and 8, Haman is elevated through a banquet and their edicts. Chapters 4 and 8, we have Esther's two planning sessions. Chapters 5 and 7, Esther's two banquets. And in chapter 6, Haman is brought down. So you've got splendor, feasting, and decrees. Those of Xerxes, those of Mordecai. Esther and Mordecai save Xerxes, then they save the Jewish people. Haman's elevated, banquet and so forth. But then Mordecai is elevated, and there are more parallels. Haman is finally brought down, and Mordecai is lifted up. All kinds of reversals. The action is set in Susa, an important city of the Persian Empire. And there's a banquet lasting six months. Can you believe a 180-day banquet? Imagine waves of visiting officials and dignitaries, and maybe the Persian Shah simply wanted to inspire uh, everyone um, maybe about the upcoming invasion of Greece. Xerxes would be fighting the Greeks and not doing so well. Herodotus, the Greek historian, depicts Xerxes as hot-tempered, as impatient. Not just impatient, but lecherous, kind of a dirty old man. He wants his wife to parade in front of his guests. His wife is Vashti. Some uh, commentators think he wanted her to walk naked, but either way, he's showing off her beauty, and she refuses to be treated as an object. Good for her. In chapter 1, the word king or queen or royal, one or more of those words appears in 20 of the 22 verses in that chapter. So it's all about royalty. But of course, we know as believers that the true king is not Xerxes. It never was, it never could be. As one person put it, a king may indeed reign over 127 provinces and live in luxury that befits his standing, but his real control over events, even his appreciation of what's going on around him, can be very limited indeed. Earthly authority leads too readily to pride, and those who bear it in wisdom know that it is rightly accompanied by humility." Those who have great responsibility must be extra humble. This is in chapter 1. In chapter 2, we, uh, we, we find, uh, interestingly, we come across Mordecai. There is a high official mentioned in the Persian records named Marduka. Maybe that's the same person. 
Is Esther mentioned in Persian records? Not that I know of. We, let's go to chapter four for our text. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do you do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape? Well, I should probably understand. Haman wants to destroy the Jews. He doesn't like them. Esther is a Jew, as is Mordecai. Esther is chosen as Vashti's replacement queen, basically after a lengthy selection process. And since the Jews are going to be exterminated, it's kind of like a Holocaust before the Holocaust, uh, she's in a position to actually do something. Although it's not easy to approach the king, if he extends the staff and welcomes her, then he won't kill her, but he'll listen to her. She's hesitating. She's not sure what to do. She's advised by Mordecai, who's like her uncle or foster father, friend, the one who brought her up, her mentor. So Mordecai says, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. That is, if Haman's going to kill all the Jews, eventually you'll, you'll be killed. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So Mordecai gives her a push and even says, God is in this. There's an opportunity here. In fact, this may be the whole reason that you've been taken into the uh, palace. And then Esther replies, what a great reply. Go to Mordecai, she says, go gather all the Jews who are in, this, in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. There is the courage. That's the girl. That's the spirit. Uh, kind of reminds us of Daniel's friends. You know, they're going to be thrown into the fire because they won't get with the program. They won't, they won't fall down and worship the statue, the idol. And so they're told, if you don't do that, you'll be thrown into a blazing fire. And they say, well, you can do that, but it's not going to change what we do. God can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we're not doing wrong. This is the attitude that we see. Such courage. There's fasting and praying three days. This is not a delaying tactic. She's not trying to buy time. <laughs> we're all good at that. No, no, she, she wants to do it right. So they're fasting. They're presenting this to God and they're preparing themselves. This is great. Well, why do I call this the silence of uh, God or God behind the scenes? And why do so many uh, scholars and casual Bible readers think, uh, maybe it shouldn't be in the Bible. It's a bit silly. It never even mentions the name of God. But his absence, that is the, the not non-mention of the word God, I think is not accidental. I think it's part of the story. It's deliberate. It's showing us that God is not inactive, that he is active, even if hidden. He's active in all events. Maybe you're going through a hard time. Perhaps there's no one trying to kill you. You're not part of a, a, a religious or ethnic or racial group or social group that's slated for destruction. But maybe you're having hard times in your own life or in your church. For Christians, that can be very distressing. But of course, all human organizations have problems and conflict. But it doesn't make it any easier. Maybe it's something with your children. Maybe the relationship isn't good with you or your spouse. Or maybe the kids are wandering. It's a family thing. Very painful. It could be trouble at work. It could be something at school. Maybe your health isn't good. Maybe it's your mental health. Whatever it is. Uh, problems, misunderstandings uh, can be very painful emotionally and even physically in time as, as our bodies recoil in pain. And we understand that. But just imagine the anxiety that Mordecai could have felt knowing that Haman had persuaded the king of the Persian Empire, the most powerful empire on earth, persuaded him to kill all the Jews. Not just Esther and the palace, but Mordecai and everyone else. And yet Mordecai and Esther work together. Sometimes we need a friend to give us a push. Uh, and then we do what's right. We may know what's right, or maybe we don't even realize. But certainly we're indebted to those people. I appreciate 
my friends who, who see clearly and who give me that support that I need. We see that God is always at work whether we see him or not. And so if you feel like God's not there, give him the benefit of the doubt. Don't, don't, don't think that God's not there. You can feel his absence. Sometimes we feel his absence, but really sometimes that's his presence even more. He is there. Assume the positive, not the negative. God is with his people even in dislocation. In these later books of the Old Testament, God's people are in exile and eventually they come back, but, but a lot of them don't come back. Uh, they stay in foreign nations so that, you know, by the time of Jesus, they are Jews all over the world. But God is with his people even in the exile, even in his apparent absence. I think that's an important point in this book. Be aware of the position in which the Lord has put you. You may say, I don't think I have as much influence as you think, or I don't think I can make a difference. Maybe little, but it's risky. You may feel that way in your workplace, but take a chance. You may feel that way in your family, but don't give up. Don't give up hope. Realize that you may be in that position because God's going to do something. God behind the scenes. You're in front of the scenes. That is, you're on the stage. It's your moment. Be aware of it. And don't, yeah, God will work through someone else if you don't speak up, but the consequences for you may be very bad. Mordecai reminds Esther, you know, God, God will save his people. But let's be part of that, not as spectators, but as active participants, and let's be courageous. So after today, we begin Unit 17, the last unit in the iFaith series, and we'll start with Ezekiel and other prophets that we've not yet studied, and those lessons are set in the 500s or the 400s BC. I hope you'll enjoy that. God bless. Have a fantastic day. Much love from Mexico.